Hi, and welcome to Season 2 of That's Ruddy Mysterious, a podcast of short tales about true mysteries. What created the Potomsky Crater? Who was involved in the 1963 Great Train Robbery? I'm not going to solve those mysteries, but they'll be interesting to learn about. I'm your host, Kelly with an I. Transcripts and references for all episodes can be found at thatsruddymysterious.wordpress.com. No apostrophe and no exclamation point. Today's tale is about the 1963 Great Train Robbery. On August 8, 1963, around 3 a.m., 15 men held up the Glasgow to London Royal Mail train. In the biggest train heist since 1855, they stole £2,600,000, or $7 million, which today would be worth £50 million, or over $40 million. The Glasgow to London Royal Mail train was a 12-car train that normally would have been carrying about £300,000, but due to a bank holiday on August 8, 1963, they were carrying £2.6 million in mostly used banknotes. At about 3 a.m., thieves turned off the green track signal by putting a glove over it and turning on a red signal to make the train stop. The red light was hooked up to a 6-volt battery. Approaching the red light, the engineer stopped the train. The thieves had cut the phone lines so that they couldn't call for help. The train's fireman and co-driver, David Whitby, went out to check what was happening and to call for help. He was captured while investigating and was thrown down an embankment. He was unhurt. The engineer, Jack Mills, was seriously injured by a blow to the head, which was the only violence committed and was the worst injury of the heist. The robbers only went into the first two cars of the train. There were 78 staff in total aboard the train, and most didn't know anything was wrong. The second car behind the engine was known as the High Values Package Coach. It carried a lot of money and registered mail. The thieves uncoupled the first two cars and attempted to drive the train to Berdego Bridge, about one mile away, but were unable to do so, so they awoke Mills to do the driving. The thieves bandaged Mills's head and had him drive to Berdego Bridge. Once at the bridge, the thieves took about 120 mailbags, weighing about two and a half tons, and brought them to awaiting Land Rovers. They then carried the bags to their hideout in the Land Rovers. The thieves only took about 15 minutes to carry out the heist. Before leaving, the thieves ordered staff to wait 30 minutes before calling police. The police said this was a clue that the thieves' hideout was within a 30-minute drive from the location of the train. The thieves' plan was to lay low in the hideout for a while, but low-fying Royal Air Force planes spooked them into splitting the cash early and leaving the hideout. The thieves hired six other thieves to burn down the hideout, but they did a terrible job. The 15 thieves had been hiding out at Leather's Slade Farm in Buckinghamshire. A neighbor became suspicious and called police. Five days after the robbery, police found the hideout. PC John Woolley responded. He found abandoned supplies, including bedding, left in the upstairs rooms. Banknote wrappers, post office bags, and mail packages were in the basement. The thieves had used real money to play Monopoly to pass the time. The police found fingerprints on the money and the playing board. Outside, the police found a truck and two Land Rovers. They believed these were the Land Rovers used in the robbery. Using the clues found at the farm, police were able to arrest all 15 men that carried out the robbery. Within one week, the police had found and arrested Charlie Wilson, one of the ringleaders. In December, police found and arrested John Weeder, Brian Fields, John Daly, and Roy James. Police were able to determine that two gangs had worked together. Bruce Reynolds, one of the ringleaders, chose Gordon Goody as his number two for the robbery. They were part of the Southwest Gang. Reynolds and Goody were friends with Buster Edwards of the Southeast Gang, and they brought him in for the heist. On September 4, 1963, Ronnie Biggs was arrested the police had found his fingerprint on a ketchup bottle in the hideout. Ronnie escaped from prison in 1965 and was recaptured in 2001. Bruce Reynolds was another ringleader. He was caught in Torquay in 1968. He got 25 years in jail. Despite catching all of the thieves, the police only ever recovered 10% or less than 400,000 pounds of the missing money. 
most of the haul was in one and five pound notes. The money is no longer legal tender in Britain, so whatever is left out there is of no use to the robbers. On January 20th, 1964, Ronnie Biggs, Tommy Wisby, Carly Wilson, Roy James, Bob Welch, Gordon Goody, Leonard Field, Brian Field, William Bowl, and John Weeder pled not guilty to robbing the train. Roger Cordry pled guilty and gave back his share of the take, which amounted to 80,000 pounds. On March 25, 1964, all but Ronnie Biggs were found guilty. Biggs ended up standing trial at a later date. He was found guilty of his part in April of 1968. On April 19, 1964, sentences were handled down for all of the men found guilty. They received very heavy sentences due to the violence perpetrated on Jack Mills. Most of the men received 30 years each in prison, which was unusually harsh for a mostly nonviolent crime. John Weeder received three years. Roger Cordray received 20 years, which he appealed down to 14. William Bowl received 24 years, which he appealed down to 14. Brian and Leonard Field received 25 years each, and each was appealed down to five years. Buster Edwards, Bruce Reynolds, and Jimmy White were discovered and jailed by 1969. The great train robbery perpetrators did not want to be in prison. Some of them mounted escapes. Charlie Wilson escaped from jail in 1964. He was recaptured in 1968. Ronnie Biggs escaped 15 months after going to prison. He was recaptured in 2001. All told, the combined sentences of the 15 men was 307 years but there were still two accomplices that were not captured. One anonymous insider gave the train schedule and cargo information to the thieves. That's how they knew that the train would be carrying more than the normal amount of money on that night. This man was known as the Ulsterman, and in 2014, one of the thieves named this man as Patrick McKenna, but this was never verified. The second accomplice gave the men the farm as a hideout. Today, the farm that the men hid on is open to the public. Anyone can go and see how the thieves lived in the days before their capture. The Monopoly board they played with is on display at the Thames Valley Police Museum. Who were the two accomplices to the Great Train Robbery of 1963? What did they do with all the unrecovered money and goods they stole from the train? What do you think? Thanks for listening to today's episode of That's Ruddy Mysterious. I'm your host, Kelly with an I. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a review and follow That's Ruddy Mysterious to be updated about new episodes. Tune in next Tuesday for another thought-provoking tale.